Nintendo Mwali be thankful unto the mother, father, creator of the universe, Kunzai Mwazimu Mokuro. Give praises unto our great ancestors, Abibi Tumi, Abibi Fahonie, African power and African liberation for all African people. This is Chakura and greetings and welcome to another edition of the Pan-African Questions, where we give concise answers to properly asked questions about Pan-African philosophy, theory, ideologies and movement. No long time, we're going to get straight into it, yeah? Was Omowale Malcolm X rejected uh, in Africa? I have heard this particular claim made a number of times over the last few years, and more recently, it was made by brother Tariq Nasheed in a conversation that he was having with sister uh, Afia and Billy Shaka on a show called The Movement. Check it out. We tried to reach out and we still want to reach out to brothers and sisters in the diaspora so that we can build up an economic base. Malcolm tried to do it in the 60s. People don't know that he was rejected by a lot of the African nations. They actually told Malcolm, hey, Malcolm, we like you, we respect you, but we kind of have we have our own problems. The Latino community did the same thing, too. They told us, hey, black people, our problem is not the Negro problem. So all of these groups turn their backs on us and we're still on this kumbaya thing. So we need to start looking out for ourselves and saying, okay, look, if y'all not trying to get on the bandwagon and fight these people, we'll do it on our own. We've done it before. We don't need no loose ends and people undermining us anyway. So this is why we're looking at our own distinct group. The claim was repeated in a recent debate on the subject can we achieve reparations in America without Pan-Africanism? And the brother uh, by the name of Dr. Logic Supreme repeated the claim. I just think it's really funny that, you know, when Malcolm X, right, he wants to mention Malcolm X so much with everything that produced Malcolm X was an American experience, right? He didn't become Malcolm X in Africa. He came, he became Malcolm X in America. And when he petitioned African countries, Pan-African, right? trying to be in Pan-African and trying to help him, right, like get something together. They told him, they said, Brother Malcolm, we got our own shit to do here in Africa. We don't got time for that in America. Y'all handle y'all own business. Research that, and right? Shout out to Brother Omawale Africa for a very surgical uh, defense of uh, Pan-Africanism in this particular debate. And also to Sister Zakia uh, for expert hosting and moderation. So as I've said, I've heard this narrative come up a number of times in the last few years. And in my humble experience, generally, whenever it comes up, it is designed for the purpose of negating the goal of Pan-Africanism and condemning yeah, the ideologies that are inspired by the goal of Pan-Africanism as ineffective they don't work and they have no practical foundation yeah and also yeah to cement this idea that pan-africanism is one-sided and that means that africans in the diaspora more specifically united states of america reach out to the continent and sometimes other Africans in the diaspora, but they get nothing in return. The Africans on the continent don't reach back, whilst all of the Africans in the diaspora, or the majority of them, or a substantial amount of them, are gathering and organizing to help Africa. And this is based upon this fallacious idea that Pan-Africanism is about helping Africa. No, Pan-Africanism and the ideologies that are inspired by it, the movements that are inspired by it, particularly of the revolutionary varieties such as universal African nationalism, uh, an ideology that I adhere to, yeah, are about developing operational unity among African people across the diaspora for the sake of liberating ourselves and each other. Yeah, so it's not just about helping Africa. This is some charity um, capitalist mindset that is being imposed on Pan-African movements. That is not what it is about. Having said that, what is the truth in the claim, yeah, that Africans on the continent largely rejected Omowale Malcolm X? Is this the case? Well, to answer the question, we're going to go straight yeah, to the words of the man himself yeah, in a speech delivered at the Audubon Ballroom, which was one of the, the central hubs yeah, for the rallies of the Organization of Afro-American Unity, which was the organization, I should say, which is the organization that he was in the process of developing uh, at this time. Uh, so de December the 13th, yeah, Audubon Ballroom, 1964, Omar Ali Malcolm X says, the following. Most of you know that my purpose for going to Cairo for the summit conference was to try and get the heads of state to realize that they had 22 million 
brothers and sisters here in America who were catching hell and that they could put forth a great effort and give us a boost if they would let the world know that they were on our side and with us in our struggle against this racism that we've been victimized by in this country for so long. The press tried to make it appear that the African countries and their African heads of state were in no way concerned with the plight of the Afro-American. But at that conference, towards the end of it, all of the African heads of state got together and they did pass a resolution thoroughly condemning the continued practice of racism against the Afro-Americans in this country and thoroughly supporting the struggle of the 22 million Afro-Americans in this country. And I am proud to state that the one who was responsible for bringing that resolution forth and getting it agreed upon by the other African heads of state was probably the last one that you and I would expect to do it because of the image that he's been given in this country. But the one who came forth and suggested that the African Summit Conference pass a resolution thoroughly condemning the mistreatment of Afro-Americans in America and also thoroughly supporting the freedom struggle for human rights of our people in this country was President Julius Nyerere. I was honored to spend three hours with him when I was in Dar es Salaam and Tanganyika shortly before it became known as Tanzania for about seven days. The one who made it possible for me to see him is with us here tonight. So by rights, yeah, I should be able to do the right, yeah, sir, and leave the argument alone. But we're going to go forward, yeah, and give a little bit more context, yeah, to the thing. I'm going to ask you to bear with me, kings and queens, yeah, because we're going to be doing a holy heap reading. There's a lot of sources that I'm going to give in this one today, and it might be a bit longer than the usual Pan-African question episodes, yeah, but bear with me. We're going somewhere with this, and I promise you, you won't be disappointed. All right, first and foremost, we have to know that in that particular speech, Omawale Malcolm X identifies the fact that it is the American or the Western media, yes, the press, that is responsible for proliferating this narrative that the African heads of state were not interested in the, in the plight yeah, of Africans in America at that time. That's what Omawale Malcolm X is saying, all right? Secondly, the man who he refers to at the end, uh, who was the person responsible for making him able yeah uh to meet with uh baba julius nyerere is a man by the name of uh abdul rahman muhammad babu who was a revolutionary leader in uh tanzania um and uh at this point was a government minister and a representative of the nation to the united nations then now we see that omwali malcolm x is making reference here yeah, to a resolution yeah, that was passed by the conference, yeah, the Organization of African Unity uh, in 1964. We're meeting at a conference in Cairo uh, in Egypt, yeah. Omawale Malcolm X attended the conference and though he was not allowed to speak, he was given official observer status and was allowed to go anywhere in the conference uh, building and meet with a lot of the delegates, meet with a lot of the grassroots activists, the press. He met with a lot of the, the heads of state and the government ministers. And he put forward an eight page memorandum uh, to the conference petitioning on behalf of Africans in America. And I'm going to read some excerpts from that memorandum right now. Since the 22 million of us were originally Africans who are now in America, not by choice, but only by a cruel accident in our history, we strongly believe that the African problems are our problems and our problems are African problems. Some African leaders at this conference have implied that they have enough problems here on the mother continent without adding the Afro-American problems. He goes on to say, we in America are your long lost brothers and sisters. And I am here only to remind you that our problems are your problems. As the African-Americans awaken today, we find ourselves in a strange land that has rejected us. And like the prodigal son, we are turning to our elder brothers for help. 
we pray that our pleas will not fall on deaf ears. He goes on to substantiate his argument, yeah, that the problems of Africans on the continent are the problems of Africans in the diaspora. I'm not going to read the whole thing, but I will leave uh, a link in the description below so you can read it in full if you want to. But the petition continues, or the memorandum continues like this. In the interest of world peace, and security, we beseech the heads of the independent African states to recommend an immediate investigation into our problems by the United Nations Commission on Human Rights. One last word, my beloved brothers at this African summit. No one knows the master better than his servant. We have been servants in America for over 300 years. We have a thorough inside knowledge of this man who calls himself Uncle Sam. Therefore, you must heed our warning. Don't escape from European colonialism only to become even more enslaved by deceitful, friendly American dollarism. All right, so we see that Omawale Malcolm X is trying to get the, the, the independent African states represented at this conference that were between 33 and 34 of them at this time, yeah, to represent the interests of Africans in America at the United Nations. He makes reference to the fact, yeah, that in speaking to some of the leaders, some of them did say to him that they have enough problems on the continent, yeah, you know what I'm saying, without adding the uh, problems of Africans in America. But what was the conclusion of these conversations? As you've already alluded to, the conference, yes, did pass a resolution in support of brothers and sisters in the United States of America. And that resolution in part read as the following. Considering that 100 years have passed since the Emancipation Proclamation was signed in the United States of America, noting with satisfaction the recent enactment of the Civil Rights Act designed to secure for American Negroes their basic human rights. Deeply disturbed, however, by the continuing manifestations of racial bigotry and racial oppression against Negro citizens of the United States of America, one reaffirms its belief that the existence of discriminatory practices is a matter of deep concern to member states of the Organization of African Unity. Two, urges the government authorities in the United States of America to intensify their efforts to ensure the total elimination of all forms of discrimination based on race, color, and ethnic origin. So that is in part, yeah, the resolution that was signed and passed by the delegates at the conference. Omawale Malcolm X is on record, yeah, of having supported and given thanks, yeah, for the passing uh, of that resolution. However, it would be true to say that the resolution is weak. And the resolution is weak because of the condition, the context of the African continent at that time. We're dealing with 34 mostly newly independent African nations whereby the colonizer still exerted a significant amount of influence. And as a result, you have more revolutionary leaders on the African continent, and you also have less revolutionary leaders on the African continent. I'm putting it kindly because a lot of them were little more than neo-colonial puppets. So the African continent itself, yes, is in a ideological and political battle over which of these factions is going to win the momentum of the African continent as a whole. If you read the history, nine times out of 10, you're gonna see these factions split into the Casablanca block and the Morovia block, yeah? Casablanca being the axis revolving around Morocco, which was considered to be more revolutionary, and Monrovia considered to be the axis revolving around Liberia, yeah, which is the capital, Monrovia is the capital of Liberia, which was considered to be less revolutionary. It is not that simple because there's all kinds of dynamics in between that, but it would be true to say you got revolutionaries and you got neocolonial puppets and you got people in between. It would also be true to say that in this dynamic, the more revolutionary minded governments and leaders are in a minority, as well as the fact that you also have already American government officials, secret agents, 
um, and other media personnel, yeah, working on behalf of the American government, yes, as well as corporations operating on the ground in many African nations and also at this conference of the Organization of, Af of African Unity. Amawale Malcolm X gives expression to this year in a speech delivered in January, January the 7th year of 1965. The speech is entitled The Prospect for Freedom and I'm going to play a snippet of that right now. At the international level in 1964, up until 1964 and through 1964, what the, the device that they use, they send well-chosen black representatives to the African continent, whose mission it was to make the people on that continent think that all of our problems had been solved. They went over there as apologists. I saw some of them, trailed some of them, saw the results that some of them had left there. But their prime mission was to go into Africa, which is a most vital country, uh, to the United States interests. So these toms, you're not supposed to call them toms nowadays, they're through you. So these uncles were sent over there. So these toms uh, don't go to Africa actually because they want to explore or learn something for themselves, broaden their scope, or communicate between them, them between their people and, and our people over there, but they go primarily to represent the United States government. And when they go, they gloss things over. They tell how well we're doing here, how the Civil Rights Bill has settled everything and how the Nobel Peace Prize was handed down. Oh yes, that's how they tell it. <laughs> Actually, they succeed in widening the gap between the Afro-American and the African. The image that they leave there of the Afro-American is so obnoxious that the African ends up not wanting to identify with it or be related to it. And it is only when the nationalist-minded, African nationalist-minded, or black-minded uh, Afro-American goes abroad to the African continent and establishes direct lines of communication and lets the African brothers over there know what is happening over here and know that our people are not so dumb that we are blind to our true mission and position in this structure. Then the Africans begin to uh, understand us and identify with us and sympathize with our problems and to the point where they are willing to make whatever sacrifice necessary to see that their long lost brothers get a better break than we've been getting up to now. So that makes it clear, yes, that on the African continent you have revolutionaries as well as agents of Western imperialism operating in government and throughout the society. But we also have Africans from the diaspora who are revolutionaries coming to the continent as well as Africans from the diaspora who are agents of Western and American imperialism also coming to the continent. And we know that the American government was paying close attention yeah, to the movements and the work of Omwale Maka Mex and other revolutionaries from the diaspora in their travels on the African continent. One such example of this year is uh, written in an article by a guy called Victor Rysel, who is known yeah, to have been a friend of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, the FBI, and was kept well informed yeah, by the FBI so that in his journalism, he could represent the best interest of American government in media. He uh, gives this account of um, Omwale Malcolm X speaking at the Ibadan University in Nigeria. This article was published in July of 1964. The effect of what he told university students in this city still reverberates in this land of 40 million people. Good people, friendly people, eager to reach across the sea to us, 
But many of the young men and women in this town now shudder when they think of us. The Malcolm X was here, brutalizing us, charging us with being a vast national torture chamber. He so aroused the students at the Ibadan University during a lecture here that they threw a university staff member off the platform when the latter attempted to defend the US. Knowing full well the hatred of the African for the African government of the Union of South Africa, Malcolm X then screamed, racial discrimination in the US is worse than apartheid in South Africa. So that was a pro-American government agents, yeah, you know what I'm saying, version of events. Thankfully, Omowale Malcolm X gives his own version of the events in the autobiography of Malcolm X, and he relates a story like this. Speaking in the Ibadan University, Trenchard Hall, I urge that Africa's independent nations needed to see the necessity of helping to bring the Afro-Americans case before the United Nations. I said that just as the American Jew is in political, economic and cultural harmony with world Jewry, I was convinced that it was time for all Afro-Americans to join the world's Pan-Africanists. I said that physically, we Afro-Americans might remain in America fighting for our constitutional rights, but that philosophically and culturally, we Afro-Americans badly needed to return to Africa and to develop a working unity in the framework of Pan-Africanism. Young Africans ask me politically sharper questions than one hears from most American adults. Then, an astonishing thing happened when one old West Indian stood and began attacking me for attacking America. Shut up! Shut up! Students yelled, booing and hissing. The old West Indian tried to express defiance of them and in a sudden rush, a group of students sprang up and were after him. He barely escaped ahead of them. I never saw anything like it. Screaming at him, they ran him off the campus. Later, I found out that the old West Indian was married to a white woman and he was trying to get a job in some white influence agency which had put him up to challenge me. Then I understood his problem. This wasn't the last time I'd see the Africans almost fanatic expression of their political emotions. Afterwards, in the students union, I was plied with questions and was made an honorary member of the Nigerian Muslim Student Society. Right here in my wallet is my card, Al Haji Malcolm X. With the membership, I was given a new name, Omowale. It means in the Yoruba language, the son who has come home. I meant it when I told them I had never received a more treasured honor. So we see again, yeah, that we've got agents, yeah, and revolutionaries on both sides of this equation. There is no real battle, yeah. Or should I say the line, the line drawn in the sand is not between Africans on the continent and Africans from the diaspora. Yeah, the line drawn in the sand are those who represent the interest of Western imperialism and those who represent the interest of revolutionary universal African nationalism or Pan-Africanism more loosely defined. And also the last bit at the end there was for me to explain why we refer to Omowale Malcolm X as Omowale. Yeah, it's because he was given that name whilst he was in Nigeria. But he had a similar experience yeah, in Ghana, just driving the point home, right? Similar experience in Ghana after having met with the Osaja for Dr. Kwame Nkrumah uh, and he relays that experience in the autobiography like this. That afternoon, 39 miles away in Winneba, I spoke at the Kwame Nkrumah Ideological Institute where 200 students were being trained to carry forward Ghana's intellectual revolution. And here again occurred one of those astounding demonstrations of the young Africans' political fervor. After I had spoken, during the question and answer period, some young Afro-American stood up, whom none there seemed to know. I'm an American Negro, he announced himself. Vaguely, he defended the American white man. The African students booed and harassed him. 
Then instantly, when the meeting was over, they cornered this fellow with verbal abuse. Are you an agent of Rockefeller? Stop corrupting our children. The fellow had turned out to be a local secondary school teacher placed in the job by an American agency. Come to this institute for some orientation. Temporarily, a teacher rescued the fellow, but then the students rushed him and drove him away, shouting stooge, CIA, American agent. So in reality, yeah, all of this suggested that even if it was the case, yeah, that the African heads of states by and large rejected Omar and Malcolm X and their brothers and sisters in the United States of America. It would seem, yeah, that he had significant support and the brothers and sisters from the United States had significant support, yeah, among the people on uh, the continent. But it is in fact not true, yeah, to say that the African heads of state uh, rejected him and the African governments rejected uh, our brothers and sisters in the United States of America. In this great and illuminating book, yeah, Baba Zak Kondo, yeah, the author of Conspiracies, Unraveling the Assassination of Malcolm X, provides this very useful information. In October, Malcolm's visit to Kenya caused the State Department other worries. Three developments seem to have worried officials the most. The first was that the Kanu backbenchers of the Kenyan parliament passed a resolution expressing, quote, full and unqualified, unquote, support for and, quote, unquote, complete solidarity with Malcolm and the Afro-American freedom fighters. The second was that Malcolm attended at least two state affairs as the guest of high-ranking Kenyan officials, including President Jomo Kenyatta and cabinet member Pio Pinto. The third development was State Department fears that emotional and less sophisticated Kenyan leaders would accept Malcolm's twisted account of the American racial and civil rights situation. So by way of historical context, yeah, it's necessary to point out here yeah, that there are three primary situations that are causing a lot of stir in the, for the American government yeah, at that time. The first was the assassination of Papa Patrice Lumumba in 1961 and the upheavals that were currently occurring in 1964 in relation to those upheavals, yeah? The American government, this was the time of the Simba Rebellion, all right? Um, whereby pro-Lumumba forces were engaged in a civil war against the forces of Western imperialism in the Congo. And the American government had intervened, yeah, to back corrupt, yeah, um, African government uh, as aspirants, yeah, in um, the Congo. Yeah, the second was uh, the British and the West in general support of white minority rule in South Africa in relation to apartheid and also in uh, what was then called Rhodesia, which is now Zimbabwe. And the third was the situation concerning Africans in America and the extent to which Africans in America were linking up with the African diaspora in general and the African continent in particular. Civil rights leaders, yeah? Um, such as Dorothy Height, such as uh, James Farmer, and such as Martin Luther King, yeah, to name but a few, had signed a letter written to President Johnson of America and his administration condemning the US intervention in the Congo and uh, requesting that they remove the, their, their troops, yeah, the American troops, and get out yeah, of the Congo. Meanwhile, Omawale Malcolm X is actively seeking to form an uh, operational alliance here yeah, between Africans in America and on the continent for the purpose of bringing the case of African in America to the United Nations. And he's referring to America as a colonizer and Africans in the United States of America as a colonized nation of people. So now we turn, yeah, to this book by brother Carl Evans, The Judas Factor, The Plot to Kill Malcolm X, which informs us, on December 3rd, that's 1964, the FBI discovered that Malcolm X had had several meetings with Kwaizon Saki. Ordinarily, this would have been of little or no importance. The Bureau, after all, had observed Malcolm over the last six months 
in the presence of Pio da Gama Pinto of Kenya, Frank Karefa Smart of Sierra Leone, and Abdul Rahman Babu of Tanzania. But given the war in the Congo, the rancorous relationship between the Johnson administration and Nkrumah of Ghana, whom US ambassador labeled another Castro, and the fact that Kwaizon Saki had been elected president of the United Nations General Assembly on December 1st, things were anything but ordinary. The FBI New York field office sent a memo to Hoover reacquainting him with Malcolm X's four-year friendship with Kwaizon Saki and reflecting on possible national security problems their friendship could create. So, Kwaizon Saki, yes, is an official in the Ghana government under Asaja for Kwame Nkrumah. At this point, the United Nations is getting ready to have a general assembly in New York, yeah? Um, at the time, in 1964, December 1964, and Kwaizon Saki is elected the president of the UN General Assembly. He is a friend of Omwale Malcolm X, and he said during the United Nations Conference to have given Omwale Malcolm X an office from which he could conduct meetings with various government officials, heads of state, and activists on the ground. Brother Carl Evans in The Judas Factor goes on to inform us on December 10th, just nine days after Kwaizon Saki was appointed President General of the Assembly, African ambassadors repeatedly compared racism in South Africa to racism in North America, just as Malcolm had requested. The first to make the link was Louis Lansana Bevogui, Guinea's Foreign Minister. Bevogui argued that Africans need not feel embarrassed about the deaths of whites in the Congo Civil War since, quote, so-called civilized governments, unquote, has failed to express indignation over the thousands of Congolese citizens murdered by the South Africans, the Belgians, and anti-Castro Cuban refugee adventures. Is this because the Congolese citizens had dark skins just like the colored United States citizens murdered in Mississippi. So, it's a hot time in the United States of America. Omiwale Malcolm X is on the scene building the Organization of Afro-American Unity. The UN General Assembly is taking place. You've got officials from all over the, the world that is in the process of a decolonial uh, revolution at that time. Uh, Fidel Castro is in town, Che Guevara is in town, and another man by the name of Mah Abdul Rahman Mohammed Babu, who we mentioned earlier, is also uh, in town. And Abdul Rahman Mohammed Babu from Tanzania, yes, representing the nation of Tanzania, which is then under the premiership of uh, Baba Julius Nyerere, speaks at a number of OAAU meetings, yeah? So Omawale Malcolm X has invited him to speak, yeah, not just at the General Assembly, but to the grassroots activist African community in the United States of uh, America. And uh, the Judas Factor relays some of those meetings like this. In the opening section of the speech, Babu drew a connection between the plight of Africans and African Americans to the delight of the crowd. Quote, the history of Tanzania, Babu said, is the history of slavery and a summary of the history of Africa, a country ruled for two centuries by feudal sultans supported by imperialist power. At the December 14th rally, Babu told the enthusiastic crowd that the same American policies wreaking havoc and bloodshed in South Vietnam and in the Congo were responsible for racial oppression in America. So again, this uh, brother from Kenya who's a revolutionary and a government minister is standing in revolutionary solidarity with his brothers and sisters in the United States of America. So basically, yeah, the thing I pop off, yeah, it's going off, yeah, in America and this, these Africans from across the diaspora are looking like, yeah, they're on the verge 
of achieving some significant operational unity uh, across the diaspora, yeah? Um, and uh, as I've said already, yeah, that Omar Ali Malcolm X was looking, yeah, for these African states, yeah, with the power, yeah, of their unified force at the United Nations to basically push the United Nations to investigate human rights abuses, yeah, against Africans um, in America. Was that going to take place? Yeah, was that going to take place is the final thing I'm going to address and the Judas Factor lays it out like this. When Malcolm returned from Africa in May 1964, after his first trip, he claimed that not only had the OAU agreed to act upon his resolution, requesting them to interject the Negro problem into the UN debates, but that they intended by the year's end to advance his second proposal by labeling America as much a colonial power as South Africa. It was December 22, yet no mention had been made at the UN of America being a colonist. To the horror and complete surprise of the Johnson administration, the situation suddenly changed, thereby establishing Malcolm X as a leader for Africans as well as African Americans and to the intelligence community, a major threat to national security. A story in the December 22 New York Times describes it best. Quote, the United States, which until recently was censured by other Western countries for fostering the independence of territories that were presumably not ready for it, is now finding itself criticized as a colonial power. Charges of colonialism, neocolonialism, and imperialism are being levied at the United States in the 24-member United Nations Special Committee on Colonialism. Although United States officials at the United Nations state emphatically that the United States is not a colonial power, the newly independent states of Asia and Africa are passionately intent on freeing all lands that are not entirely self-governing whether they want independence or not according to one united states spokesman so family i'm basically gonna leave it there yeah made the case all right um suffice to say there's far more to the story yeah than Omawale malcolm x being rejected by african heads of states uh, when he went to Africa, and there's even more that I could have put on that, yeah, in terms of uh, Omwale Malcolm X's sojourn in Mama Africa, which is one of the most underappreciated aspects, yeah, of uh, his life uh, and his legacy. I know somebody, I wonder, yeah, why Guan, yeah, what did Guan from that point until now, if they was all on this thing, uh, or so many people was on this thing at that time? And the short answer to that is, you know, the forces. Uh, of European imperialism galvanized and basically waged an all-out attack on all forms of, of black nationalist pan-Africanism um, and black power throughout the world. So if we understand, yeah, basically, that um, after this point, COINTELPRO was in full force attacking the Black Panther Party, the US organization, the Nation of Islam and all other formulations, um, the Black Liberation Army, the... the, the um, the, the Republic of New Africa, yeah, and all formulations of uh, resistance that were taking place um, in the United States, yeah, to the point whereby we still have political prisoners in jail right now, yeah, free Mumia, yeah, because that's the current issue right about now, free Mutulu Shakur and all political prisoners. If we can understand that that is the case and that's what took place, yeah, in the United States of America, I will just ask you, yeah, to understand, yeah, even if you're not fully aware of the history, yeah, that a similar attack, yeah, was waged on the African continent against all of the revolutionary leaders. We're talking about a number of assassinations. So, for example, Amawale Malcolm X is assassinated months after the events that we're discussing right about now, in February um, of 1965. The Osage for Kwame Nkrumah is overthrown, yeah, um, in, uh, in uh, April, yeah, of 1966, the following year. Yeah, the very following year, he is um, overthrown, yeah? And so a lot of the revolutionary... Patrice Lumumba is already assassinated. And in fact, 
um, prior to the overthrow of, of Asaja for Kwame Nkrumah, there had already yeah, been um, uh, at least 11 yeah, coups and assassinations of uh, progressive leaders and governments um, um, on the continent of Africa. Yeah? Um, and following the overthrow of, of Asaja for Kwame Nkrumah, there were a number um, um, more, yeah. So the re the reality that we have to come to terms with as Pan Africanists is that we just lost a lot of battles. The might, yeah, the full might, yeah, of European imperialism was waged against us, and we've lost a lot of battles um, from the sixties until now. But we're still here, and it wasn't just confined to the continent of Africa or the United States of America. In the uh, Caribbean, yeah, throughout the Caribbean, this took place also. Do you know, in the nineteen seventies. People like Walter Rodney were assassinated. Even people like Peter Tosh, yeah, uh, the revolutionary music icon, was assassinated. All right, um, and and then you know if you go into the eighties, there's Morris Bishop and others, kings and queens, and so we just have to bear in mind that, that is the case. Same thing for the anti-apartheid movement and the the the, the imprisonment of um, of um, of Nelson Mandela. The assassination of many leaders, yeah, many, 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 many leaders, yeah, um, bigging up uh, people like um, Robert Sabukwe and uh, uh, Steve Biko, Mama Namzamo Malikizela, Winnie Mandela, who kept the fight alive despite, you know, various different attacks against her, both physically um, and in terms of her personality as well. Character assassination was a massive thing. And that is just the reality that we have to deal with. Um, and in fact, um, when it comes to this issue of Omoale Malcolm X, yeah, one of the things that we have to come to terms with and deal with uh, as well is the extent to which this misinformation, in, in, the, the lack of knowledge yeah, around what Omoale Malcolm X did in Africa and the disinformation around what he did in Africa and what the brothers and sisters did alongside him in Africa is actually a manifestation of the COINTELPRO agenda. And I can prove that to you just by a small snippet um, from J. Edgar Hoover's official memo to his operatives in terms of what they need to be doing uh, in relation to COINTELPRO. And J. Edgar Hoover said, the purpose of this new counterintelligence endeavor is to expose, disrupt, misdirect, discredit, or otherwise neutralize the activities of black nationalists, what he referred to as hate type, organizations and groupings, their leadership, spokesmen, membership and supporters. So a part of the program is to deliberately misdirect and one of the best ways to misdirect is to promote misinformation and disinformation. And so to the extent, yeah, that people believe that Omar Malcolm X was generally speaking roundly rejected by Africans on the continent, is the extent to which that particular COINTELPRO has been achieved, that is being perpetuated uh, in our community. And so for my brothers and sisters who are Pan-Africanists, who are universal African nationalists, who are black power advocates, we just have to understand that that is the part of our challenge today. And we have to rise to that challenge, yeah? We can't complain about it. It is what it is. That is our challenge and we have to rise to it and counter the forced narratives, yeah? And speak the truth and set the record straight in terms of the liberation efforts of our history. But most importantly, most importantly, let us do our best, yeah? To stand on those shoulders, to build on that work and manifest it in today's world, um, you know, in a way that does justice to the efforts and the sacrifices of those like Omawale Malcolm X. And with that, I'm gonna give the last word as I gave the first word to Papa Omawale Malcolm X. Let's give him the last word taken from the autobiography of Malcolm X. I can only wish that every American black man could have shared my ears, my eyes, and my emotions throughout the round of engagements which had been made for me in Ghana. And my point in saying this is not the reception that I personally received as an individual of whom they had heard, but it was the reception tendered to me as the symbol of the militant American black man, as I had the honour to be regarded. And with that, long live the work and the legacy of Omowale Malcolm X. Tenda Mwale, Kudzai Mozeo Mokuro. Abibi Fahondie, Abibi Tumi, Uhuru, Uhuru, Uhuru.